Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another wonderful series in the Get Connected webinars. I am so honored and proud to be our co-host and co-sponsor along with the Alliance for Business Leadership, of which I am a board member and with my partner in crime, Jen Benson, who is the president of that wonderful business organization. For those of you who are not familiar with Get Connected, Get Connected was just named by Boston Magazine as the best networking group in Boston. And our mission really is to curate meaningful business and professional relationships to advance leadership development and learning like we are doing today in today's webinar and to really foster cross-cultural relationships which we need so much more of today more than ever and we are proud those of us who are part of the get connected network to say that we are indeed the premier organization that is doing that. We haven't really lost our, while we haven't been able to meet in person, we have continued to pivot and to do so online. We actually had a networking event recently and we'll do so again before the end of the year. But we, we think today is an important conversation it has been five months since the death of George Floyd. And for many of us, that was a racial reckoning for this country. And it's time for an important continuance and continuation of the conversation around racial equity and equality and to address systemic and structural racism in our society. I know that there are people out there who think, okay, it's been five months, you know, I have marched, I have protested, I've done all the right things, now let's move on. Well, for people of color, and in particular for Black people, racism is a nightmare. But thankfully, we have good people who get into good trouble, like the late civil rights icon, the Honorable John Lewis says, and they are on this panel. And I am proud to be sharing this platform with them. Each of them were chosen specifically and carefully. They're all honorees of Get Connected. We have Beth Chandler, who is the head of the Y Boston, and under her leadership, the Y has become the premier anti-racist organization that teaches corporations and organizations how to address this issue, how to become anti-racist and how to be an advocate, an ally, and an accomplice. And she is also an honoree as one of the 100 most influential people of color in Boston and one of the 25 most influential LGBTQ individuals here in Boston. Both Andrea Silver and Mary Jo last year were honored by Get Connected for being diversity, equity and inclusion allies. What we referred to lovingly as woke white women. Andrea has taken EOS Foundation and made it really the key organization and foundation that is addressing issues of gender inequality and racial inequality. She is a serial social impact entrepreneur. If you are a woman entrepreneur and you pass through 
the Center for Women in Enterprise. Thank Andrea. She started that over 20 years ago, and it continues to be a place where women, and in particular, immigrant women like myself and women of color get mentorship, support, access to resources to grow their business. And she continues through her work at EOS to support organizations like Get Connected so that we can offer these seminars for free to all of you. So thank you, Andrea. I am so proud to be on this panel with you. And my very, very good friend, Mary Jo Meisner, for those of you who know Mary Jo and the fabulous, unbelievable, amazing work that she did when she worked for the Boston Foundation as its executive VP, the number two person there. Many of the programs that were started about whether it was issues that impact the Boston community. You know, we know that she was responsible for those, those many reports about immigrant work, about inequality, housing. She was behind those, the indicator report, the Commonwealth seminar. And so we wanna thank her for being here and for participating. And Jen, you have done an amazing job when you were a legislator at the state working to ensure equity and inclusion and the work you are doing now as the president of the Alliance for Business Leadership. We are proud of that work, proud to partner with you. And now I am going to pass it on to you to say just a few quick words. Great. Thanks so much, Colette. And I am honored to be here. The Alliance for Business Leadership is honored to be supporting this event. And I look forward to hearing from all of our fantastic panelists. And many thanks to Get Connected, of course, for hosting this important conversation. Uh, and Colette, I have to also thank you for your lifelong work um, toward bringing people together to talk about the tough issues of race, our personal relationship to racial equity, and the historic systemic racism we must all continue to understand and overcome. And we were talking a little bit right at the beginning of this event and uh, when we were preparing and I said, you know, this is a conversation we have to keep moving forward. And I'm so happy that you have, you're such a resource for the city of Boston and for Massachusetts and beyond. So thank you so much for your leadership. And I'm really looking forward to chatting today with all of our fantastic panelists. Um, so let's dive right in. And I I'll also wanna give all of you an opportunity if you'd like to, before we start really talking about the questions and we're getting questions in our, our chat box, so our Q and A box. So anyone watching who wants to submit questions, please do, we will get to them. Uh, so I'll start with an opening question, but please use this opportunity to um, provide any background observations as we move forward. So though we're celebrating the 100 year anniversary of women winning the right to vote, Black women were excluded from the suffrage movement and following they were left out of the women's rights movement. and. We need to change this dialogue and value intersectional leadership and the in the advancement of all women. How can white women be an effective partner to elevate the voices of black women? And is it even fair for black women to have to explain any of this to us? Uh, I would love to hear personal examples and anecdotes of where this has either worked, not worked, where has it been done well? And please, please, for those of us who want to be allies, um, help us understand. Is this, are you, this I imagine is for the black women. <laughs> well, it's for all of us. It's for okay. all of us. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kick it off. You know, Please. I like to uh, talk. So I would say that allyship to me is really about being able to listen, to learn, and to grow. 
um, for black people and for people of color. And I'm going to speak now for black on behalf of myself as a black woman, that for me, allyship is not about white knights riding in on a white horse to be a savior for black people. It's really about working in partnership equally. And I'll give you an example of what allyship is not. I was watching television a few weeks ago and I saw a group of white allies took over a restaurant in DC and was really kind of trying to shame people into, you know, saying black lives matter. Black. That to me is not what allyship is about. You need to fall back and let black people lead. Let them tell you what, how you can be helpful, not you coming in with all the answers and all the solutions. And we have to work together. It's a partnership. And if you look at how the civil rights movement worked, it was really about a partnership with white allies working collectively together to make real meaningful change. So that to me is what allyship is about. Mary Jo, you are unmuted. Would you like to chime in? Sure. Um, thank you, Colette and Jen, for having me um, on this webinar. Um, it's a real privilege to be with the two of you, but it's also such a privilege to be with my friends Beth and the Andrea. Um, I, I, when I think of being an ally, um, I come to it, I hope, with a fair amount of humility and, and gratefulness that I have thought of that way. Um, but I do think the first thing we have to think about is we need to listen and learn as, as white people before we can go on and take on that incredible mantle of being called an ally and being an ally. And I, once we have done that and have really started thinking about who we are and what our privilege is and how black people and other people of color and what their lives are like and taking the full measure of that, then I think allyship becomes one of action and taking action instead of just assuming that by our thoughts and our our niceness and our ability to be friends and colleagues, we are being an ally. I think allyship really is about taking action and about putting oneself into the role that you have at that moment, whether it is lower down in an organization or as you accumulate power and position, it is actively taking those roles and putting into action things that you can do and very mindfully doing that um, and doing it with an intent of changing the structures that have come before us, many of which we all say we had nothing to do with that. Well, perhaps we did not, but now it is up to us to really actively um, take um, the roles that we have been given and to do something about it. I guess, Jen, I'll, I'll jump in. So Beth Chandler, YW Boston, again, happy to be here. Thank you, Colette and Jen, for, for the invitation. Um, and for those not familiar with YW Boston, our focus is on helping organizations create more inclusive environments so that women, people of color, and especially women of color can thrive at all levels. And so I wanted to just talk about two things. Uh, in the initial question Jen asked about, um, women of color, and particularly Black women, being left out. And, you know, what, what I think people can do about that is, is one, acknowledge when Black women have been left out and when they are being left out. Look at who's in the room and are you getting the perspectives, like who's missing? Whose voice and perspective would be a value add to the conversation? Um, black women, women of color were involved in the civil rights movement. They were involved in the suffragist movement. They were involved in all the movements, but they often got erased. 
right? No one talked about the contributions they made, which were really vital to all of those movements. They may not have been the face of those movements, but their work was integral to their success. And so it's important to acknowledge that history um, so they're no longer erased and forgotten for the contributions that they've made. And around allyship, I think an example I'll give is uh, my former uh, board chair, Vim Minicello, when my predecessor had to retire, we did not have a succession plan. And the board was grappling with, well, what should we do? Should we do a search? Should we appoint somebody? Should we use an internal candidate? And you know, Mim and I knew of each other because you know I was on staff, she was uh, chair of the board, but we didn't have a, a close relationship. We didn't you know work closely together. And Mim said, you know, I think you can do this. I think you can step into this role and lead this organization. And so I'm going to go to the board and ask that you be interim. Um, and I'm going to give you what support I can. I'm going to ask you for what support you need in this role because I think you can be successful. And I'm going to use my political capital um, because I believe in you and the work that you could do. And that to me was an example of allyship. She wasn't expecting anything in return for me. This wasn't any charity, um, but it was she was putting herself on the line for my benefit because she believed in me. That to me is an example of allyship. And it's not, I'm going to, you know, give you something that I don't really care about anyway. Um, and when we think about, you know, I, I, I remember hearing somebody uh, from an organization that uh, takes goods from, from people to donate. And often they say that the goods that they get, they can't even use. And so it's more work for the organization to receive those goods because they can't use them. And so it's, you know, how difficult is it for what you're doing for somebody else? Are you looking for gain? And if it's about charity, if it's about the gain you get, then to me, that's not allyship. Allyship is really thinking about perhaps in some cases, what are the sacrifices you might be making to give somebody else an, an opportunity and thinking about what is the, the, the equity in that. Andrea. So I'll jump in here and again, very honored and I'm actually humbled. Um, and, you know, as everybody said, I just practice extreme listening and sometimes I'm even wondering what I can contribute to this conversation um, because Frankly, it's just so important to hear um, from Colette and Beth, but I'm really glad to be here and, and thankful to be adding, as Mary Jo does, our perspective. Um, so for me, allyship is kind of an interesting term. I don't really think about it, um, although Colette has told me I'm an ally. So thank you, Colette, because I think uh, of my life um, under the, the tent of the Jewish word tzedakah, which is social justice. And so that is who I am. That explains my work. So for us, those of us, uh, the Jews and those that think about their life in terms of Zaka, we have to right wrongs. It's just the way you live in, it's how you live in the world, right? So it's not like I turn on a switch from, oh, I'm gonna be an ally now. It's when I see things that are socially unjust or economically unjust, I feel like I have to do something about it. So from very early on, I started my career um, on Wall Street in business. And from very early on, I realized that my, my life's work was really around the feminization of poverty, which I now realize through my dear friend, friend Beth Chandler is about the intersection of gender and race. And at the intersection of gender and race, you find poverty and you find racism and, and all those other things that keep perpetuating this problem. So um, I'm always learning. Um, so, so I'm in the mode, I think all the time of, of uh, being an ally, um, but I'm always learning. That doesn't mean that I'm always doing the right thing or I'm always aware. Um, and most recently when the um, racial justice movement reignited the trustee at the EOS Foundation. We're a charitable foundation. We make investments in nonprofits and um, we do a lot of anti-hunger work in schools. And the trustees of the foundation and I decided that instead of just giving to a variety of wonderful groups that were doing racial justice work, we would ask women of color, particularly black women, who they would like us to contribute to. 
And I think that that really, money is power. Um, philanthropies are powerful. And instead of saying, oh, we're just going to give this money to the NAACP or YW, which of course we did. Um, you know, we already had the relationship with Colette and with, with Beth and we were gonna support your organizations, but then we reached out to a number of new friends that we met through um, the Boston Women Leaders Network and who shared their stories um, with us about what racism meant for them. And uh, we reached out and said, we'd like to make a $10,000 donation to the charity of your choice. And um, for me, I think that was a really wonderful way to, to be an ally. And Beth, as you say, it's, um, it's so much, it's such a two-way street, you know? It's, um, you're both in it together. You know, Jen, I'd, I'd like to pick up on um, what Andrea said there about, you know, constantly learning, because I do think that allyship is a journey. It's not something that you're born into. It is something that you learn. And I think, so, uh, for me at least, I won't speak for others, but um, there have been some crucible moments yeah, in my career, uh, particularly, um, I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that before I was at the Boston Foundation, I had a 25 year career in the newspaper business and worked in editorships at newspapers around the country. Uh, including the Washington Post, where I oversaw the coverage of an extremely difficult story. Um, it was when Mayor, former Mayor Marion Barry, the late mayor, um, was at the end of his mayoralship, and he was struggling, as we all know, um, with addiction to drugs and, and other issues. Um, and it was an extremely difficult to cover story on the face of it, but it was also extremely difficult because of the dynamics of working for a white newspaper, a, a newspaper, the Washington Post, that was really seen as very white in a city that is really very black, um, covering a man who was an icon in the civil rights movement, but had fallen into, you know, a series of struggles. And what I learned through that entire experience was that I, what I was bringing to the table was only very much a small part of that story. And that I really needed to understand other voices and other points of view. Um, and it was, it was truly a crucible for me. And after that point and went on to become, you know, an editor at other newspapers, uh, including the next one where I was managing editor and in charge of the entire newsroom. And I started a program called Total Community Coverage that then became part of an industry-wide effort in which we really talked to reporters about you just cannot come to your daily job with what your experience is, with what your networks are, with what your sources are. You have to expand everything to include the total community. Um, and so I think we, if we're, you know, real with ourselves, we understand that there are crucible moments that we go through that change and add to our ability, I think, to be good allies, but we certainly, as white people, are not born with that. Um, and we need to understand our privilege and our need to, to learn. Thank you. And I've been monitoring some of the comments and questions coming in. And, and I think Gary uh, said something that really exemplifies your story and what you just shared is that allyship is a verb. It's not a noun. It's something that we do. It's something that we work. And, uh, and, and it gives the sense of, of it is a dynamic process, right? And so I think that his uh, comment is right on um, in this conversation for sure. So we have a question. Um, what are some of the most meaningful actions we can take in our daily lives to be truly anti-racist? And, you know, maybe Colette, do you want to kick this one off too and give us your, um, your sense on this and we can open it up to everyone.
mute. I need to unmute. <laughs> um, I think it starts with being willing to hold the mirror up to yourself and to recognize that all of us have blind spots and that we bring to our relationships, how we show up in the world, our full experience, how we grew up, what kind of household that we grew up in, what are, were the family dynamics and what was said in that household um, about people of difference and people who are different. And so I think that the first step that to really addressing, and I feel like somehow we people have to be willing to move from allyship because ally, it's not just good enough to say I'm an ally. You have to take it to the next level and become an accomplice. And an accomplice means that you are willing to step out of your comfort zone. You're willing to put your whole self on the line to support people who are different. Um, I want to give a shout out to one of my mentors who has been a mentor to me for over 30 years, um, former Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Murphy, who, when my business was at a, in its nascent stage and had hit sort of a snag, um, Evelyn came to my office every week and literally as an economist, went through my books and said, you got to cut here, you got to cut there, you have to, you know, how are we going to keep this organization whole? And, you know, 30 years later, I'm still here, even though companies like, um, you know, other big companies, DE, or what you call the DEC, digital equipment and Polaroid, that were around then are gone and wang. And I have to say that that to me was moving beyond allyship and into accomplice ship because she took a personal, this was as if it was her company and she took a personal interest in wanting to ensure that my business was going to survive as a black entrepreneur in a city that has not always been friendly and welcoming to black people. So I, I, I think for me, that is what allyship is really about moving into accomplice ship. Uh, Beth, would you like to weigh in on this? So I, I think in one way to, or a couple ways to think about being an anti-racist or, or living that out and, and being an ally, I think part of it is doing your, your own work. And I think Colette alluded to that. We all, we all come into this world as part of a system, right? And we often think of racism as what's happening just between individuals and not how does it manifest in other ways? And so it manifests internally, ideologically, institutionally. And so part of it is doing your own work to really understand how is that showing up? What does it mean? How do you understand that? Um, and then I think part of it is, is acknowledging where do we have advantage? Um, you know, in thinking about how we identify, there's often ways that we have advantage as well as, as well as disadvantage, right? So what are the ways that you have advantage in this world and how are you leveraging that advantage to help others? And really think about, you know, if you're wanting to be an anti-racist, what are the policies, practices, beliefs that you're putting into your life and instituting um, capitalizing on the advantages that you may hold because of different aspects of, of your identity, right? And you know, a simple one, particularly for people who identify as men in, in a meeting, how often is it that a woman says something and no one hears her or ignores her or talks over her? And how often do you say, you know what? 
you know, Colette had, had a great idea and I'd really like us to delve into that a little more. Or, you know, you gave so-and-so credit for that idea, but it was really Susan who mentioned that first. So, you know, and how, how often do you do that? And that is a very simple way of being able to really be an ally, um, whether, you know, across issues of, of race, gender and other issues, right? But that's just an example of how you can use advantage when you have it to really support someone else. And you, Mary Jo, please weigh in. Um, well, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Beth. I mean, playing those daily roles of just speaking up and speaking out and, and kind of spotting other people in the room and identifying where they are just by, you know, the looks on their faces and bringing them into the conversation. Um, obviously all the things that have to do with hiring and mentoring and uh, uh, changing practices and procedures and structures in your organization. But, you know, frankly, also, I think it's just showing up. It's every day showing up, you know, going out and being part of our community and going to places where it's not just, you know, your, your usual suspects. It's becoming um, an, a, a, you know, a constant learning individual that is, is taking part and showing that you're gonna be there um, in whatever way that you can. So we can all do that. I'll jump in here as um, somebody who runs a foundation you know, when someone comes to me, what's the first question? You know, I have a lot of power because I have money, right? And I'm under no illusions that when I don't have money, I won't have the same power. You know, it's about the money. It's not about me. Um, so I need to do what I can while I have it, while I have this position. And when someone comes to me to ask for support for their nonprofit, you know, you have one first question. And that first question should be, what are you doing at this moment to fight racism? What are you doing at this moment? Because our work at, at the EOS Foundation, we're focusing on gender. What are you doing for women of color? In fact, let's go deeper. What are you doing for underrepresented minorities? Which is sort of a definition that we see used in higher ed, which is black, Latinx, Native American, indigenous, and Hawaiian Pacific Islander. What are you doing for those groups and disaggregate? Like we've got to go deep and we have to ask that question. And when you start there, it's kind of startling um, to people. And it has so, so much of a bigger impact just by asking the question of sort of talking about what priorities are. So I think that that's something that I feel fortunate that I get to do. Um, and I think there are things just large and small. Um, Beth talked about sometimes you need to sacrifice that you, you have to be willing to have really uncomfortable conversations because people say, um, generally, people that I'm around are all um, good intentions, but sometimes they say extremely racist and sexist things. And whether you're in your book club or you're at the office, it's really hard to figure out what to say and you have to practice. Like I, you're so tongue tied when something like that happens you have to practice. And I go to my friends and I'd say, hey, Colette, this happened. What, what could I have said? What could I do? I mean, I just think you know, it goes back to this. This is constant. The learning is constant. So um, the other thing that we're doing at the foundation is, um, you know, we're doing a ton of research um, to find what the power gap is. We call it the women's power gap. How many women are at the top? But while we're doing that, we're doing racial research and we're really focusing on women of color. And um, again, the data just continues to tell us that right at that nexus, women, white women are getting ahead and men of color, African-American men, black men, a Latinx men and women of color, um, particularly black and Latinx women of color are not. And so it has to be our number one. We as women have to put that first. That has to be the first question. Where are the women of color, specifically Black and Latinx? And I just want to thank Andrea and the EOS Foundation for all the work that they're doing around this. Um, 
NGO's organization did a report, uh, it was last year that talked about, I started a couple of years ago looking at uh, mass public you know, commissions and boards and what was the gender and racial composition of those boards. And we're actually using that research at YW uh, to push for legislation so that there is more racial and gender diversity on mass boards and commissions. And that was in large part because of the work uh, that the EOS Foundation has been doing around that. And that's a perfect example of what an accomplice does. They literally walk the talk. It's not just good enough to verbalize. You show up and you do the hard, sometimes uncomfortable work. So Beth, thank you for acknowledging um, the EOS Foundation and Andrea's remarkable work. Thank you for that. I'd love to dig deeper into this idea of, of women of color in leadership and in business. And we have a great question. Um, perhaps Colette and Beth, maybe you could take a first run at this. There were 2.4 million black, owned, uh, black women owned businesses in 2018. Black women are the only racial or ethnic group with more business ownership than their male peers, according to the Federal Reserve. However, the gap is widening between the average revenue for businesses owned by women of color and those owned by non-minority women. For women of color, average revenue dropped from 2007 to 2018, while for non-minority businesses, revenues rose. What has it been like as a Black woman to run your own business? Uh, what are some of the ways that other women, white women in particular, can help support Black female entrepreneurs, businesses, and corporations? And I would love to dig further into um, this idea of uh, board membership, corporate board membership, and public sector board membership, and what that uh, influence that might have on some of these um, issues. Well, I think I'll, as a business owner, I'll take that two parts of that question too. I have to say that in my three decades of being in business, if I'm going to be completely um, transparent, that the women, the white women who have been supporters like Evelyn Murphy and Andrea and Mary Jo have been far and few in between. They are the exception and not the rule. And I hate to have to say this, but it's true. White males have been much more supportive of my business than white females. And I think that white women can become better accomplices and better allies by really beginning to align themselves in asking again, the right questions. Um, I will give you an example. There are organizations out there and that's why what Beth and Andrea are doing is again, remarkable. And um, the group that we belong to, uh, all of us, the uh, Boston's uh, women's leadership network. I think I saw Gail Deegan, who is the co-founder of that organization on here, and Evelyn Murphy is also a part of this. What they're doing to change that dynamics, because all of these organizations talking about women on corporate boards, we're not talking about Black women or women of color. It really was about Gender diversity did not include racial diversity. I think, however, with the awakening that we are going through, that has shifted. And I would love to go back and see two years from now, three years from now, how things would have changed and if there are more women who are going to be on commissions, more women on corporate boards that are of color. And the Boston Globe just did uh, a big article, Shirley Leon, 
that of the hundred corporations, largest corporations in the Commonwealth, not one black woman was on those, on the boards of those companies. And I dare say, in some instances, not one black person. That to me is really unacceptable. You know, I mean, when you have so many talented people of color, one of the reasons I started doing these lists was to make it easy so people don't have the excuses, we can't find anybody, we don't know where they are. Well, hello, here they are, I'll give them to you. I'll, I'll do the hard work and make it easy for you to do this. Go to the Y, they have a whole bunch of people in Lead Boston that have gone through that list, you know? So this is, this is, this is why I think this conversation that we are having has to be real and has to be authentic and um, is needed because, you know, people need to know here is what you can do. If you are truly serious about working and helping black women. And I want to say that if you are thinking, why are we focused only on black people until this country gets it right? with racial healing and reconciliation between blacks and whites in this country, they're not gonna get it right with women. They're not gonna get it right with Latinos. They're not gonna get it right with Asians, with immigrants until they get it right with blacks. Black people are the only people in this country that came here against their will and were enslaved not even the indigenous people who themselves were treated badly were enslaved, bought and sold as property and continue for 401 years to still be victims of systemic racism. So until we get this right, we are not gonna get anything right. So you know what Colette and Beth have both told us is that we have to be courageous and we have to step out of comfort zones and we have to speak up. So I'm on far too many boards, uh, nonprofit and public boards in this city um, than you know, I probably should be, but I make it part of my service to play that role. That I, I think that is one of the things I have to do. And if that organization is not putting forward people of color, women of color, if it's not using all the resources that Beth and Andrea and uh, Colette have provided for us among many, many others that exist, then you know we're, we're not fulfilling our, our uh, leadership roles. So we can all do this and uh, we, you know, we need, and it's not even courageous most of the time, it's just doing it. And, but if you're in a room where it's somewhat uncomfortable to kind of say, hey, you know, I don't see anybody of color on this list. You need to do that. Yeah, I think we can just all set goals, you know, so for instance, um, many of you might know um, Gender Avenger and Gina Glantz, who sort of popularized this whole thing about panels. Um, you know, panels that only had men, but mm -hmm. what about panels that have no color on them, that have no diversity on them? We can, when people call and ask, will you serve on this panel? And you just say, how many women of color are on it? Are there any black or Latinx women? Mm -hmm. And if not, you have to be willing to say, well, I'd rather help you find somebody rather than serve myself, that's one thing. I think we just have to be so intentional. Next thing, what, what do you spend personally and professionally? You know, Where do you spend your dollars? Make a goal, set a goal. I am going to go to a restaurant that's run by a black um, owner. I am going to buy holiday cards. I am going to whatever you do, set goals, mm -hmm. I mean, we started at the foundation, we started a, a group, a breakfast group, and our goal was 
to have 50% women of color in the group. And, and somebody said, oh, well, they're only 30% or 40%. So why have 50%? Well, I think we can overcompensate for all of the years when we got it wrong. You know, it's like Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, you know, oh, what do you want? Nine women on the Supreme Court? And she said, yeah, of course I want nine women. No one thought it was a problem when there were nine men, right? So it's the same thing. I think we got the pendulum swing a little, right? So set some pretty damn bold goals um, that overcompensate. And uh, gosh, there's just gonna, there's an embarrassment of riches right now, especially in our city of black women who are rising, you know, get to know them, mentor them, you know, when you meet them, ask them their stories. There's just so much you can do. There's nationally, if you're doing any political giving, there's a lot of black women who have flipped house seats. Are you, are we supporting them? I just think we, there's so many ways to do it. And people have resources large and small, but make yourself a goal and just hit it. That's great. We have a, um, Beth, did you want to weigh in on this or would you like me to move to the next question? All right. Okay. Great. So um, we have a question from Liz. Uh, as company leaders or organization leaders, how can we continue to encourage and grow allyship within and outside of our companies in these times of self-isolation due to the pandemic? And I love this question. Um, how do we continue to grow relationships and community um, through this horribly difficult time for all of us? Beth, do you want to take a stab and like maybe share some of the resources or, or tools you're using? Sure. I mean, I can give a few examples. So at YW Boston, for example, we have affinity groups. So we aren't a particularly large staff, but we have a affinity group of people of color, affinity group for, for white people, and they get together um, every other month and talk. And so that's, you know, something that we've been doing. There are other organizations that we've connected with who have had book group discussions where they're having staff. It's not mandatory, but it's, hey, we're going to read this book or this article. We're going to get together, you know, twice, you know, a month on Thursdays and have this conversation. They have guest people come in. So I think there are, are numerous ways that you can leverage technology. And quite honestly, Sometimes you get more people that are able to participate um, because there's a little more flexibility. You don't necessarily have to get to some place. You just have to link and be on Zoom or Teams or whatever you're using. And we had a, a, a woman on staff who actually was relatively new to the organization, wanted to get to know people. So she got on everyone's calendar and did Mad Libs um, for, you know, 45 minutes. And so it was an opportunity to do something fun, but also get to know someone in a different way. So I think there are, you know, you're only limited by your, you know, your creativity um, and your desire to just reach out. Um, something that I've been doing uh, now that we've been in the pandemic is I'll set some time just on the calendar for people to join me either before work for, you know, coffee, tea, or, you know, on Friday at three or four and just putting times on for people to join. And it's just about having con conversation and connecting. So I think there are, again, plenty of ways that people can, can connect, particularly with other people in your organization. And that's what we're hearing most people um, are missing during this time is the informal uh, ways to connect with one another. You know, we're not meeting each other in the hallway or in the lunchroom. And so what are ways that you can create that? Um, because it's something that people really are desirous of. That's great. And Colette, obviously networking, bringing people together is your wheelhouse. <laughs> so please tell yeah, us, so, uh, obviously uh, this has we, been fantastic. So tell us more. It has been, we have partnered with a couple of different organizations. One is the Commonwealth Institute. And um, we actually did uh, a networking event with them where we broke people out into groups and had icebreakers. And it was a fun evening. You know, it wasn't heavy topic. It was just to get to really know people and get to know each other. Um, we have partnered with the, um, the Newton Needham Cham Regional Chamber to get to, again, reach out to other parts of the um, greater 
Boston community and get to know new people. And just in keeping these events, getting people, I love the fact that Beth talked about a book group. Next month for our holiday event, we are going to um, focus on well, health and wellness and keeping your mental health healthy and things that you can do. We are gonna have things like our um, virtual Zumba and Afro yoga and how to talk to your um, therapist um, if you are feeling stressed, because even though um, people may not be going to see family or having family over during the holidays, being housebound by this pandemic is stressful for a lot of people who maybe are not used to being. So we're gonna address those um, issues and to give people an opportunity and a list of resources and things they can do to sort of break out of the doldrum. So um, stay tuned. That's great. Thank you, Colette. Mary Jo. You know, I think if, uh, if you're in a position right now of, of um, you know, in your organization where you're a director or manager or supervisor, um, I would ask you to think about people in your group and your organization that, you know, you should know and, and that could use a little help right now and that you could reach out to just out of the blue and say, hey, you want to have a Zoom coffee, um, you know, and to talk. I think we can, uh, if we just keep our antenna up, I, I think we know people that need, you know, outreach and, and need some help and need some kind of, uh, you know, friendship and, uh, and collaboration right now. So I think we can all do that. And I would just ask particularly people in positions um, of, of management um, to, to do that. Thank you. And, you know, just as an example, uh, Colette and I have met during this pandemic time and talked quite a bit on the phone and I really consider her a mentor. So thank you, Colette. And uh, as an example of building a relationship during a pandemic, we have this really great, and Andrea, I'm going to start with you on this because um, I've heard you speak about these issues very eloquently, and I, I think it's a tough question, so I, I oh, trust no. you. Um, Lisa asks, and I will paraphrase because it's a long question, that there are some, I would say quite a few, white people who do not understand white privilege, that believe because they are personally struggling or they are working multiple jobs or that they have not necessarily felt privilege within their own life, that white privilege is not a real thing. And do not put stock into that idea. How do we speak to some of our colleagues, friends, family members who maybe feel this way to explain how this dynamic is really embedded in our cultures? Uh, wow, it's, that's such an important question. And um, always, there are so many people who are hurting and always there are many people who face different types of demons, of, of discrimination. And so the, the term white privilege may not be the right term for that person. You know, sometimes you get caught in semantics, right? So I think the most uh, powerful way. And I'm in, I mentioned before my book club, I'm in a very mixed book club with um, some people who have more conservative leanings than certainly I do. And I've had to have some pretty um, uncomfortable conversations. And sometimes we agree to disagree, but at least to have a, a conversation, I, it just really helps to talk about discrimination, just racial discrimination, maybe get away from the word white privilege and just talk about racial discrimination and what that feels like. And actually I used um, Colette, I used in, a, in one of my book clubs when somebody was questioning um, whether really it is that hard to be, um, if you're an affluent black woman, how, why is that hard? And, and, and you had mentioned that you had to get rid of your Mercedes, right? 
that, that you just kept getting pulled over because nobody could imagine that you own that car or if you were in a fancy shop in Copley Place. So I actually think using the, the stories, I mean, that really resonates with people. And so let's not argue over the white privilege or the semantics of it. Let's just talk. And, and that's why I, I'm glad we're talking about Black Americans. I'm glad we're talking about this specific issue and about 1619 and 401 years because it is different. It is different. And we need to talk about discrimination against Black people and what that looks like. We certainly need to talk about discrimination against Latinx and other folks, but we can't, the moment right now, we have to reconcile with the country and with the unique um, an insidious way that we've dealt with racial discrimination. So that's that's how I handle it. I, again, still learning, still learning, but let's meet people where they are. I feel their pain. I'm surrounded. I live on the Cape and uh, most people think it's a wealthy community, but the year-round community is pretty blue collar. And my heart breaks that so many fishermen can't provide for their families. And you have to meet people where they are and you have to feel their pain because it's awful. It's awful, but that can't, you can't let go of the fact that that doesn't wipe out 401 years of racial discrimination. I, the way I deal with the whole question of friends that I have who, you know, say that they have, they grew up hard and we, everybody has a story. Um, this, city, the state, this country is a country of immigrants and people came here and struggled. The Irish left the famine, the Italians came here, the Jewish um, people came here, lived in ghettos across the country. Yes, white privilege does not mean that your life was not difficult. What it means is your skin color is not one of the things making it difficult. And even it, when you are, if you were a white blue collar person or a working class white person, you still get a better interaction and treatment than a highly educated black person because of your skin color. And it, it doesn't diminish that you had a hard life. It just means that your skin color isn't one of the things contributing to your hard life. So it, it is really important as Beth, as Andrea said, to really listen and to recognize, yes, I can, I can empathize with someone who is struggling, who is not black, who might be a white person, but you cannot, the, the comparisons are completely different. And black people are still being actively discriminated against for no other reason than their skin color. So, which is something they have no control over. And while I'm addressing this, I'm also going to bring up the fact around people who say, when you say Black lives matter, and people say, well, all lives matter. Yes, everybody knows that all lives matter. But all lives will never matter as long as Black lives don't. And blue lives, there is no blue lives, you know, there is... Um, a career. You chose that career. I, did, I am born with black skin. I can't change that. That's part of who I am. So you can't compare your choice of career with my ethnicity and say that, you know, blue. Yes, all lives matter. Every single person. But it's not going to matter as long as black people are not treated with equality, and we continue to have systemic structural racism. Yeah, 
You know, one of the things I'm thinking about while we're having this conversation and reading the comments, and I will say we've had a lot of questions we're not going to be able to get to, but a lot of really beautiful supportive comments. So I want to thank everyone who's submitting those questions and comments. But, you know, part of this event, and one of the reasons why I was so excited about joining this event is really about creating and supporting a sisterhood that is beautiful and diverse. And, you know, one earlier comment was made uh, that, you know, white women, Colette, you, you mentioned this, white women have been less supportive of you and your business than white men. Uh, I'm wondering if that is also all men, you know, and I wonder if we can reflect on times in our own careers where men have been in some ways better mentors, promoters um, in our careers than women. And I think that as we talk about developing and, and, and um, supporting a sisterhood, we have to make sure that that's all sisters, right? That we are all here supporting one another. Um, and the idea of allyship needs to be among all women. Uh, and so I'm wondering, maybe Beth or Mary Jo, could you talk a little bit more about sort of ways to support the women in our professional lives and active ways to support women um, in whether they're in lower levels of their career or even mentoring above us? I think that is uh, a great way to sort of wrap up this conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jen, I, I uh, think that is a real issue. Um, in my career, it has been an issue. Um, I frankly have had mentorship more often uh, from men than I've had for women. Now that may also be because I was in a very uh, male dominated industry, the newspaper business, but um, I, I think even beyond that, it, it, it's a true fact. Um, so I think we, we need to recognize that <clears throat> for whatever reason that is out there and maybe it's because women feel like they have to fight over scraps sometimes. And so they're going to be not as uh, um, open uh, to helping one another, but I think all of us can identify that that is something that has occurred in the past and that we should do something about it. And so therefore we would be, we should be proactively reaching out to um, certainly the younger women coming up in our organizations and in our networks. But I must say, even in, you know, organizations where we are amongst women who are our equals and who are part of our generation um, and know that some of them have sat on the sidelines and we need to bring them in. Or on the other hand, maybe say something um, offline about some advice about how perhaps they could be more helpful or more open and do it in a very, you know, thoughtful way. Uh, but I think we need to keep each other honest about this kind of stuff. And I will just add, I, I think as Mary Jo was saying, often I think we believe that there are few spots, right? We see one or two women in position of power in an organization. So we think there's only one or two spots. And so that can make it difficult for people to think about, well, how do we change that and make, their, make sure there are more opportunities as opposed to we're all fighting for the same position. And I think there's also, you know, because of the society we live in, there's a lot of misogyny. You know, and I think we have unintentionally bought into that and, and, and are internalized that um, ourselves in, in some ways that we have to really think about as women, what, what you know, how do we think of, of women? How are we defining women? And it's, you know, I think pretty broadly is, you know, who gets to be defined as a woman or, or not as a woman? And how do we see women in leadership roles? 
Um, often there are stereotypes, right, of what a woman leader is, particularly as a white woman or a black woman. And so if people don't live into those, um, we now, we might discount them for being leaders. And so I think part of it is up to us, again, to do our own work about, you know, what are the, the issues that we're having around our definition of, of women and women leaders and what they can and should be, and how do we break down those stereotypes that we may hold and not be aware of, so that we really can think about how do we support each other, how that they're if there are two positions, how do we fight to make them four, as opposed to saying we're gonna to have to fight amongst each other for the two that seem to go to women. So I think there's work we can do on ourselves to, to understand what's holding us back from being able to be more supportive of women to then help us be able to support each other better. I, I would like to just say that I think that anywhere, picking up on what Beth said, anywhere that we're in a group that we question so we're, we're in the door, right? Uh, and we question the criteria. I mean, there's so much is set up to exclude people. Oh, we can't, we can't add more black women to this group because this is the criteria and there are none that meet that criteria. And you have to be a CEO and you have to be a this. And, and I just hate it. I hate all this criteria because then when I say, well, what's the purpose of the group and how does the criteria speak to the purpose and it's just a total disconnect. So we're all in groups that I frankly don't think are inclusive enough. They're, they don't include enough young people. I, I mean, I just can't get over how many talented young black women and men there are in this city. And I reach out to black men as well. And why aren't they in our groups? You know, that's definitely a two way street that we would learn a lot. I mean, gosh knows. I can't take care of anything technology based if I don't have someone under 30 <laughs> near me, you know, so it's true. It's so two way, but we have adopted, we as women have adopted systems mm -hmm. that have worked for 2000 years for men, right? That have been based on exclusion. And so I, we have to bust that wide open. I mean, Beth, you are so right. Why can't those two positions be four? We have to ask basic foundational questions about why. Why can't there be? Women often also, it was interesting, women have said, you know, why can't we have co-chairs? Why does it have to just be one? Hierarchy is a construct. Mm -hmm. So let's bust it open. Colette, yeah. tell us, let's wrap this up. Can yes. you please give us your wisdom? How do we bust it open and, and move on from here? Well, I think we are busting it open right now. <laughs> we have, this has been a very powerful, enlightening, um, edifying and inspiring discussion. This is not about shame and blame. It's really about how do we collaborate? How do we build bridges of understanding instead of walls of separation? And, you know, it was on that premise that I founded Get Connected 12 years ago, because I wanted to create an inclusive network where you can drop in from Mars and no one will look at you and say, who is that greed guy? Why is he here? You know, you could walk in the room and feel like you belong. And really that at the end of the day, we all want to feel like we belong. We want to feel like we are respected. And I always said, I don't want to be tolerated. Don't tell me about tolerance. I want to be accepted. You know, there is a difference between tolerance and acceptance. And this is what inclusion and diversity and equity is about. You know, when we think about it, Diversity is being invited to the dinner party. Inclusion is getting a seat at the table and equity is being able to have a meal. Even if you're vegan or vegetarian or gluten, you can get a meal at that table. And that's what equity is about. And so I really want to thank you, Jen, for your generosity and openness and enthusiasm about partnering with Get Connected 
to do this series. And I want to thank all of the wonderful, inspiring women on this panel for your wisdom, for your insights, and for your continuation of being accomplices for changing the world, for getting into good trouble. So I want to thank you all for that. And I want to thank all of our attendees on this webinar, even though we can't see you, we know you are there. And thank you for taking the time and for listening, learning, and hopefully you will take some of what you learn, go back and basically put it into your life and make things happen, get out of your comfort zone and, um, and grow. So thank you everyone. Have a great rest of the day and the rest of the week and stay tuned. We are gonna do white men who can jump and we are gonna speak to white male leadership in this city about what white men could and should be doing to change the move the needle for women and for people of color. So stay tuned, October 20th.